to the 2015 Global Volatility Summit. I hope uh, you realize that we have a theme of technology and innovation today. So on behalf of BNP Paribas, I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to our sixth annual Global Volatility Summit. Throughout the program today, the various panels and speakers, that will be a key theme on how volatility will continue to impact the world we live in. Today, we're going to talk about innovation and how it affects the marketplace. Really, the objective those, that six and a half years ago is exactly what it is today, to be able to really educate the end user base around what volatility and options really are and whether that plays a role within your portfolio or not. You're used to these kind of behavior where you get these spikes and then you get these plateaus down. So it's important that firms, managers, evolve and take advantage of what I believe we're in now, which is a new regime. And that new regime is fueled by the fact that we've had the largest regulatory overhaul in the past 80, 85 years since Glass-Steagall was, was created back in the 30s. And you've got, in my opinion, a, a new way of trading. And this regime is going to create dislocations. So you see dislocations here, and that's opportunity. Certainly on the positive side, if, if nothing else, the emergence of these VIX products has made volatility trading mainstream. If you went to a cocktail party 10 years ago and said, I'd trade volatility, you'd get kind of a sideways look, like, what are you talking about? Now you talk about volatility, it's like, oh yeah, I bought this TVIX thing and it went to zero or doubled or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it was supposed to do. People now have access to these products. You can trade the VXX. You don't need to have a futures account. You need to have an options account. You can go out and buy something. And there is a legitimate hedging purpose for, for trading these products. There's been extraordinary uh, monetary policy uh, you know, all across the, the, the globe. Is this a positive or negative for volatility markets? Uh, four words. Taper tantrum, dots, patient. We're all focused on what the Fed's going to do, when they're going to do it, how fast they're going to do it, what the pace of the US quantitative easing unwind is going to be versus Europe, what's Japan doing with Abenomics. There are so many different opportunities that have come along in the last few years as a result of things that the, that the central banks have either talked about doing, things they've been doing that they're going to unwind. All these moves are related to either direct central bank action or people trying to handicap what's going to happen with, with central bank action. So I think it's been a definite uh, plus for volatility traders and, and the volatility business over the last few years. We're talking about salary scheduling. I think it's important for us that we uh, frame the discussion and give you an idea of what tail risk means. At the endowment level, we have a fairly low uh, amount of systematic risk, and we're fairly liquid relative to most other endowments. So you wouldn't think that we'd need a lot of uh, tail risk hedging or, or protection for the portfolio. But when you look at it from a, a university perspective, there's a lot of things strategically and financially we're really levered. So we want to play risk because we got to make money to support all this. We have to take risk to do that. But if there's a really big risk event, uh, then what we sort of refer to as the probability of ruin can be very high. From that and from sort of understanding the, what creates negative convexity in endowments, they, they understand that they need to pay a little bit of an insurance premium to kind of buy back that, uh, the thing that, that, that doubly magnifies the probability of ruin in a big event. Uh, I think in the the tail risk event depends on the, the composition of the portfolio and the context. I truly believe that active management really, really helps in tail risk management. But in tail risk management, uh, monetization is very important and it should depend on your, the objectives that you define. You have to monetize to a great extent because those dislocations will disappear very fast. Markets have short memories and the walls can come up very drastically. The other thing with the active management, you should be able to monetize the different dislocations. So I think uh, these, these principles and being disciplined about it and having a little bit of active management 
really helped. I think also a successful program would be one that you can stick with over time, should that be your philosophy and your program. In our case, we do report to a board of directors, and having that conversation again year after year after year um, can be difficult. So I think there's a, a significant element of, of human behavior in the equation. The bottom line is, is that if you want to make something visible, you just have to learn how to look at it a little bit differently. What's the black box in finance? What it's derived from is that the problems of, say, institutional investors are roughly parallel to the problems of the United States Air Force, um, which is basically how do you move a big position through the market without revealing that position? What's strange to me is that all this is happening because the market no longer has a human interface uh, to operate it or to even observe it. Um, and it's sort of fascinating that all the tools that we developed to make finance and the economy more legible have actually made it impossible to read. Arguably, um, we may be further from understanding the market than we've ever been. I want to read to you why it's important to listen to these takeaways and the predictions from the first annual uh, Global Volatility Summit. And this was uh, in, in early 2010. Regulation will take time to play out, but will change uh, volatility risk taking and the provision of liquidity for years to come. As banks who had been uh, historically warehousers of risk, will, regulation will force them to become transporters of risk. When you get a spike in vol, there's no fear in the market at all. The first thing that gets bid is an index put, an S&P put. And the reason why is that it's liquid, it acts as an insurance policy, and historically has always been an insurance policy until the last couple of years when people use them as yield enhancement products. How is the rising rate environment affecting volatility in equities and in other asset classes? Who would like to take that one? Please. Well, I think for the time being, as long as you have expensive monetary policy plus uh, uh, excess of cash in the market, it tends to lower the level of volatility. But I think the day um, we, 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 have, we, are, we reach the end of this uh, bull market, then we are going to see major volatility. I'm going to look at three classes of tail hedging strategies. One is equity related tail hedging strategies, um, CTAs, as well as discretionary tail hedging strategies. In my opinion, systematic tail hedging strategies are too expensive to work. And in all uh, asset classes that I have looked at, and all the tail hedging, systematic tail hedging strategies I have modeled, they all tend to underperform. If you think there'll be very few defaults, it's probably a good idea to sell credit wall, but they never happen with any warning, so it's, it's a very risky trade. The market is not completely, uh, completely irrational. The third reason, which is probably the most important, is that the underlying instrument itself, which is credit, that looks nicely correlated when you plot it like this, it hides the fact that the underlying instrument itself is negatively convex. It's almost like vol of vol. It's like selling options on VIX rather than S&P. And the reason is defaults, when they happen, rare as they may, may be, can completely destroy the returns. In other words, the underlying returns are very skewed. Asian vol usually exhibit characteristics that are quite different from what we're seeing, for example, in the S&P market. Uh, so on the Mayopa arbitrage uh, slide, we talked about the fact that usually uh, spot and volatility are negatively correlated. So when the market goes down, you expect volatility to go up. Uh, in Asia, you actually have uh, uh, a market that is very d dominated by a structured product and that exhibits a positive correlation between spot and volatility which the results in very low skew levels, contrary to what you're seeing in S&P. If in practice you're hedging at the index level or the macro level, of course the market's not actually going to zero, and if it is, you can't monetize it anyway. So what's, what's the maximum practical move you can make? Well, if you use S&P as a proxy and you look back over, say, the last 50 years, the largest drawdown within a 12-month period S&P had was during the crisis. And so what that means is if you're trading equity puts, if you bought at the money S&P puts prior to the crisis, exited when the market troughed March of 2009, you would have had right around a 50% of strike terminal value. One can observe, of course, with boom bust cycles, as the cycle matures, you tend to get accelerating interest in buying dips from investors. 
there's a focus on return and much less of a focus on risk. Um, there's also typically an interest in harvesting risk premium more aggressively, going out the risk curve. And when you add all these things up, this can lead, as was the case in the last crisis, particularly in the credit space, into situations where risk premium becomes so compressed that they actually can create incredibly attractive opportunities to own uh, convexity against a systemic shock. We're seeing long volatility carrying in a lot of places. Kevin uh, mentioned FX. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that there's opportunities for managers to have you know, volatility across multiple asset classes and to take advantage of these kind of mini, mini wildfires that occur. Um, you know, and who knows where the next one's going to be. But there's plenty of stresses that could, could cause something to happen in many places. So we do look at a lot of uh, you know, equity replacement type things in uh, steep skew, downward sloping forward curve markets. A lot of these products that, you know, that we look at, at the end of the day, most of the underlying component of it is a, a really simple call or put option. And so maybe just spending a little bit extra time, we really like to spend a little bit extra time looking at uh, these individual components. What worked in the past most likely is not going to work in the future and, and vice versa. So we truly try to identify space where some strategy hasn't worked for a good reason, but the opportunity set starts to change. And we cannot time those things, but what we're trying to do is to find in a bad performing strategy good managers that have the ability to not bleed too much as the timing improves, but then have a really strong research and capacity and understanding to actually benefit from the opportunity set as it improves. So let's, let's kind of combine these two things. How does inflated volume lead to inflated volatility? Inflated volume definitively leads to inflated volatility. We talk about volatility too, we look at it on an intraday basis. The stock opens at 10 and closes at 10, some people say, well, hey, you know, there's not a lot of volatility. Well, if the intraday range went from 9.75, 10 and a quarter, to $8, $12, I would call that pretty volatile, even though it closed unchanged. Mm -hmm.